Okay, so let's get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie Schwartz. I'm the founder of Road to College and the 80,000 member Paying for College 101 group. For those of you who don't know me, um, our goal is to educate families about higher ed and in particular college admissions with a focus on paying for college. So I'm personally excited about tonight's topic of um, understanding college's financial health because this is exactly the type of information that we really want parents to start to understand. And so before we get started and I introduce the other guests, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We're on Zoom. We're also actually on Facebook Live. Um, so if anybody's out there on Facebook Live, it's always nice, or even here in Zoom, if you want to just say hello, um, tell us where you're from. We usually get you know, parents from lots of different places across the country. Also nice to hear how many kids you have, if, most likely if your kids are in high school, what grade they're in, in college. Just really nice to know all that information um, and to see who's out there. And my other little bit of housekeeping is, we get this question a lot, is this recorded? Yes, this is recorded and it, it's actually recorded on Facebook automatically and um, it's recorded in Zoom. So we'll be sending out the link. If you, um, you know, can't stay for the whole time, don't worry, you'll be able to um, watch it again uh, whenever you want. Okay, so, oh, I see some uh, things coming in. We've got Jody from Long Island. You've got a high school senior and, and um, a college student. That's someone's from Miami uh, with a 12th and a 10th grader. Great. Lots of uh, somebody's from Philadelphia. Wow. Okay. All coming in. Nice to see you guys. Okay. So let me introduce our guests tonight. I'm excited to have um, these three people here from a uh, lots of different angles of higher education. Um, I'm going to start with Jeff. Jeff Salingo. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Great to see you again, Debbie. So um, let me give everybody a little background about Jeff. Jeff's been writing about higher education for the past 20 years. He's been published in a variety of media in places like The Atlantic, Washington Post, The New York Times, and he was also the editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education for 16 years. Um, Jeff's an author of two New York Times bestsellers, and his most recent book just came out this past Tuesday. I see it in your back shelf, Jeff, <laughs> and it's called um, Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions. It's already been reviewed by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. We did a Facebook Live with Jeff about a week and a half ago. Tons of great information. You guys can look at it on our Facebook page. But um, the book really gives people an inside look at what the admissions process is at three different schools. And I, I actually pulled out this quote. I love what uh, Frank Bruni wrote about um, your book. He said it was one of the most nuanced, cool-headed examinations of the admissions process he's ever read. So I really um, recommend if anybody with a, with a high school senior out there, or even anybody who has a student with a high school student, um, you should really get the book. It gives you an uh, inside scoop about admissions. And um, we're also giving away 50 of the books tonight. So maybe you'll be one of those lucky winners. So thanks, Jeff. Glad to have you here. It's great to be here, Debbie. Thank you. Um, we also have Susan Fitzgerald. Susan is an associate manager, managing director at Moody's Public Finance Group and manages Moody's higher, global higher education and their not-for-profit ratings team. They rate nearly 800 colleges, universities, and not-for-profit institutions worldwide. She has extensive public finance experience and you've served as a senior analyst on both higher education and healthcare ratings teams. So thanks for being here, Susan. We're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we're welcoming Scott Galloway. Hi, Scott. Nice to, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, Scott's actually, you're one of my favorite podcasters. I listen to you a lot. You're also an author and a professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, your profile has definitely increased in the last few years. I've always impressed with what you've got going on. You're the founder of Section 4 a company offering online courses where you can get MBA insights without the MBA price tag. You're also the host of the Prof G Show and the co-host of Pivot. And you have a very interesting blog called No Mercy, No Malice. So I encourage everybody to check out Scott's writings and his opinions at his blogs and the podcast. And most recently, Scott, I know you've had some opinions for um, parents and college administrators about the never-ending increase in college pricing and the impact of COVID 
on higher education. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more of your opinions about that tonight, because that's definitely going to factor into some of the questions. Okay, and one last thing, I want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, who is GradGuard, um, who made tonight possible and who's also helping us to give away 50 of Jeff's new book, Who Gets In and Why. So we'll be picking winners from everyone who's registered tonight. And for those of you who aren't familiar with GradGuard, they are a technology enabled pioneer in developing innovative protections designed to reduce the cost of co college life. Since 2009, GradGuard has partnered with nearly 400 colleges and universities and they've protected more than 750,000 students and families. They have a lot of interesting products. Probably the one you're most um, familiar with is tuition insurance, with, which helps to financially protect families in case your student can't finish the semester. Okay, so thanks for bearing with me. There was a lot um, up front, but let's get into our topics. So um, I know we're going to talk about like the details and some specifics about data and factors that families should be looking at to check out a college's finances. But before we get into that, I thought it'd be interesting to just talk a little bit about the disruption in higher ed that we've all been seeing over the past few months. And some of us, we're not just seeing it, we're feeling it, right? Our students are home, um, getting their education. They're not getting it in person anymore in most cases. The admissions process has been completely disrupted. Um, students, you know, they're trying, but they're not able to take standardized tests. We're not able to visit colleges. We're not even quite sure how this whole admissions season's gonna go. And personally, I'm hearing more and more families, you know, ask themselves questions like, you know, is college still worth it? And can I really afford it? So with that as a little bit of a backdrop, I'd love some to hear if you guys have any advice that you would give to parents, particularly parents who are sending their kids or applying, the, that kids are applying to college this fall. Like how can they make good decisions with all of this disruption going on as they start to navigate the college admissions process? Jeff, any thoughts? Since this is kind of um, a lot about what you Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just be, I'll, I'll make two quick points, Debbie, because I know we have a ton tonight. Um, you know, First is that uh, I think that colleges are going to be pressuring students, pr particularly selective colleges, are going to be pr pressuring students on early decision this year. Uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on uh, on one of your events, but you know after the 2008 recession, as I found in the book, selective colleges went from about 25% of their class early decision to almost 50% of their class because they wanted that certainty in the fall when the Great Recession hit. I think the same thing is going to be happening this fall. Many colleges were already close to 50% of their class anyway early. Um, yeah. Again, selective colleges, if they can push it up to 55, 60%, wherever they can push it, they're going to, because they're going to want that certainty in a year of uncertainty. And what's interesting to me is that that's going to be pushing against students who can't get to campus to see the place. They can't get test scores. Uh, many of them are virtual online high school, so they can't talk to their high school counselors. So colleges are going to be pressing with you unless you know you really want to go to a place, uh, unless you know you're not going to have to worry about financial aid, take your time. Uh, and because I think there's going to be a lots of advantages in the spring for colleges that are, uh, you know, really going to need to fill their class, going to be discounting tuition. So I think you're going to be better off in the in, in waiting if you can. Uh, and then the second piece quickly is I would lean into the ROI on your degree as much as possible. There's so much more information out there now about the return on investment of your degree, even by program. So earlier this year, the education department added to the college scorecard the uh, basically first year earnings of students, not only by college, which they always had, but now you can actually look by program. Right. That's information that you know is, is power, I think, in the hands of consumers. And I think you should use that and lean into that a lot more than you would have had in past years because you're going to want that job after college. Yeah, no, a lot of that's a lot of good advice, um, particularly about the early admissions. Um, hard decisions, you know, for for students um, that are kind of being pressured right now about what to do. Scott, do you have any thoughts that you could give to parents and students? Um, like Jeff, Jeff's going to forget more about this than I'm ever going to know. It's just, <laughs> it's so situational. I'm getting probably a dozen emails a day from parents and students saying, 
you know, should I go, should I defer, should I gap? And it's, it really is situational because if a kid gets into Yale and, you know, the parent says it's going to cost me three or $400,000 of post-tax income, I'm like, yeah, absolutely send your daughter. The Yale's, that's already paid for itself, the fact that she's got into Yale. I wonder if in 10 or 20 years kids are going to be skipping college or some kids and just saying I got into Yale because I think the primary value is the certification that the largest HR screening mechanism in the history of mankind, elite universities, has decided mm-hmm. that you're worthy to be casted into the upper, you know, the upper echelons of our society. Um, or if they get into Cal State Northridge, which is $7,000 tuition, 17000 out of state, decent education, good professors. I'm like, yeah, that's a good bargain. And then there's sort of these what I call near Ivies that offer a leafy experience for the same price as an Ivy, but quite frankly, feel more like adult childcare for rich kids. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that's going to pay off. I don't, I don't know if you're going to get your return there. So it's just very situational. What I would suggest is that parents be ruthless about trying, uh, obviously the early decision uh, calculus, I don't understand nearly as well as Jeff, but just be consumers, be ruthless consumers. I always suggest that as soon as you get in, try and get into more than one and call them and confidently and say, I really want to go to university, but I got a better deal over here. Can you match it? And do the same, you know, when people are so much more ruthless when buying a Toyota than they are when picking a college. So try and create as many options for yourself as possible, including maybe even the thought that you might not go for a year, which Mm -hmm. is kind of unthinkable until just this last, this last year, and then be a ruthless consumer. Because if you look at what universities are doing, they're ruthless. They've decided that their, their, their refund, imagine a hotel saying, if you don't cancel 180 days before we keep the whole tuition. And by the way, you have to come. I mean, these are very consumer unfriendly organizations. So I would, I would reciprocate and be equally as ruthless in selecting your institution. I think it's great advice. I mean, quite honestly, that's what we've been trying to tell people for years, that they should really view this whole process, you know, a little bit as they are a consumer, they're a consumer of higher ed. And that's the reason why they need to be educated on the process. They need to kind of know what data to look at and maybe more so this year than ever. Um, And uh, I know sometimes people don't like to hear it, but I completely agree with you that um, at some point, you know, um, you might need to call up a school and say, you know, um, I can't make it or, you know, I need more funding. Um, and, you know, these are huge financial decisions um, and you should be able to kind of have options um, going into them. So i um, glad to hear your advice. Um, I obviously appreciate it. Susan, you have any quick thoughts for people? Sure. Um, and I'm in a position where um, we're dispassionate observers around the financial health of colleges and universities. We're not in a position where we could necessarily give advice. But what I would say is one of the tremendous strengths of the US higher education sector is the diversity of it. And Scott mentioned a number of different types of colleges and universities. So I think as we saw after the the last recession, um, when there was a tremendous growth in students enrolling in higher ed, the most expensive college degree is the one that you don't complete. So as much as anything, um, it's really selecting the right institution, the right fit for an individual student. And the good thing is that there are lots of, lots of options out there and an increasing amount of information. I saw Jeff sent the link to the college scorecard, but I think um, higher ed financial health, um, there's not a lot of transparency for it. You do have to hunt and peck to do it. And it's pretty esoteric stuff to try and read financial statements, but but more of it is becoming available. And so I think it is easier to become a savvier consumer. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think that's always been kind of what we push to is that um, there is data out there right now. It's not the easiest to get, but um, you know, we try and educate people about where to get it. And um, you know, there are sources and you know, I, I empower people to go get the um, data because it will really kind of um, open up your eyes. And I think when you have the data, you'll make a better decision. Mm -hmm. And some of the information that Jeff sent around on the college scorecard gives you some of that information around retention rates, graduation rates, et cetera, in addition to kind of the return on investment calculus that it helps point you to. 
Okay, so um, moving on, and um, I do want to kind of get into the details of, you know, we're talking, we're now starting talk to talk about data and, um, you know, what factors people should be looking at. I actually got a question emailed me today from a parent um, that, and I'll just read the question and then um, kind of lead into um, each of you, I think we'll have uh, different, different pieces of information to provide. But this parent said, is there one particular negative financial health indicator that I should be looking at to decide whether or not to even have my student apply to a particular school. Um, so, you know, again, people are kind of looking for like, you know, what's that indicator of information that's going to tell me whether the school is healthy, not in healthy. It's probably not going to be one piece of information. And I know, Susan, we spoke earlier in the week because uh, this was another question that I got was, you know, what are some of the top things that a family should be looking at in terms of a college's finances. And you had like a really good summary of, um, you know, what the basic family should start to understand. All right, and, and as I said before, it's hard for someone who doesn't do financial analysis to really calculate the numbers of ratios, for example, that we would be doing. But if you look at financial statements and you follow a multi-year trend, and I do think trend analysis is important. And what's happening with their net tuition revenue, for example. That's the biggest revenue stream for most colleges and universities. And sorry, do you mind just maybe explaining a little bit what that means? Sure, so net tuition revenue is, most colleges and universities do a lot of, offer a lot of financial aid. They do a lot of tuition discounting. So the net revenue that they, they receive is basically the gross price minus the amount of financial aid that they've been giving to students. And on financial statements, that's a line item that you can track over time. And if you see that that is going down, it can be a sign of some enrollment challenges or other challenges. And to the extent that it's the largest revenue stream, it could indicate that a college or university is going to have to be cutting costs rather than investing if they want to balance their budget. Um, you can also look at the income statement of their financial statements and basically look and see are they running a surplus or a deficit? Are they generating a balanced bottom line? So kind of the trend analysis of that combined with a, a balance sheet look, a very quick balance sheet look of how much cash and investments does this institution have? And um, will give you a sense of the resources that they have available and their ability to balance on an annual basis. Well, you know, that goes along. Um, I got, it's very interesting. I got a lot of questions about a school's endowment. I think, you know, because that's been in the news too about schools that have a better endowment that, you know, they have kind of like a safety net. But the, some of the questions I got were um, like, if I'm looking at a school's endowment, what exactly should I be looking for? And um, like, what constitutes a small endowment versus a large endowment? So I'll tackle that again. And then anybody who else who wants to- Oh, sorry, that was to you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, the, the endowment, you know, it's a term that's thrown around loosely. It can mean multiple different things, but, but essentially an endowment in its purest sense are gifts that have been accumulated over time by a college or university for a specific purpose. So this whole concept of a college can just spend its endowment however it wants is not re the reality under kind of legal trust law implications. So um, the amount of endowment really depends on the size of the institution or, or the relevance of the endowment, the size of the institution, right? A hundred million dollar endowment for a billion dollar operating base is very different than the reverse. So endowment has to be put into context and into the, into the perspective of what is that endowment restricted for and those are um, conversations I, I think that are, are valuable to have because you can have a large endowment for the School of Theology, for example, but a very small endowment for the College of Arts and Sciences, and that'll determine how much resource is available for any particular program. And can somebody really get that level of detail someplace or? Some institutions have better disclosure than other institutions. Mm -hmm. Because um, I know that people, have, it's been recommended to just look at maybe uh, an easy thing to look at is just endowment per student. And endowment per student gets you part of the way there. It doesn't get you the entire way there. And again, it's a question of how restricted it is and, and can they spend that endowment. Now, what we also see sometimes is financially strapped institutions borrowing against their endowment. 
which is why understanding that the absolute level is important. But I would point to that again, if, if you're looking at financial statements as an indicator of a, an institution that might be under stress, in the footnotes, they'll discuss the endowment, the levels of restriction on the endowment, and many will disclose if there has been borrowing from the endowment. And borrowing from the endowment can be an indication of stress. Okay. Um, Jeff, how about, can you tell us um, a little bit more, and Susan touched on it a bit, about um, this whole idea of tuition discounting, uh, different pricing strategies that colleges use, and, you know, to that end, is there specific data that, that families can be looking at to better understand, is a school discounting? Do they, uh, you know, what type of pricing strategies might they be using? So, so the vast majority of schools do discount. And as I talk about in my book, uh, there are, the world of admissions is kind of buyers and sellers. And one of the things that frustrated me when I was reporting the book is that I think too many parents and students really approach the college search from a, a fit standpoint. We keep talking about fit of college, right? But we approach it from an academic and social fit rather than also a financial fit. We think, oh, everybody discounts tuition or I'll get a scholarship or I'll be able to pay for college, right? We don't think enough about how we're actually going to pay for college until we get the acceptances come in and we get the financial aid packages. So what I try to encourage parents and students to think is to think about the financial fit upfront. Um, and the way I think about that is this world of buyers and sellers. Most colleges are buyers, meaning they don't have brand names. They have to go out there and buy students. Most of the world is like that. There's only about 60 colleges and universities that are true sellers. They really focus most of their financial aid on need-based financial aid. But if you're a parent who doesn't qualify for need-based financial aid and you don't make enough to actually pay the write-off check, those places are not going to be great for you. Yes, they are the brand names. But they're going to, they put almost all of their financial aid in, in need-based aid. And the best way you can look at this is on the common data set, which is a, a, a document that almost every college puts up on the web. If you just Google university and common data set, you can see uh, on section H, which is all about their financial aid, you can see a, a column or a, a line that looks at institutional financial aid. And there are two columns, need-based and non-need based. And you'll see pretty clearly at some of the elite schools, the need based aid column is so much bigger than the non-need based aid. But then uh, take a, so Emory, for example, 9% of their, all of their financial aid goes to non-need based aid. Compare that to a place like Tulane, more than 50% of their institutional aid goes to non-need based aid, right? So that, those are two institutions that might be on somebody's list together. Emory and, and Tulane, and they have completely different approaches to financial aid. And I think that's really important for students and parents to understand very early on, because I saw way too many students with all these sellers on their list, they get their financial aid packages and they're like, how am I going to afford this? Right. Um, yeah. And I emphasize also the, the people can get this information, kind of understand this before your student even applies. So that, cause it's heartbreaking to get those stories kind of in April um, where um, maybe you're, they're excited about that they got in, but then it, that's the point they realize, wow, I'm not getting the money I thought I was gonna get in, and I can't afford this school. So um, good advice. And um, Scott, you made a, um, a splash, you know, not that long ago with the way you analyze colleges and you put them into different categories of thrive, survive, challenge, and struggle. Um, so I'd love to hear, and I think people have already, we, we see questions about it, kind of like what was behind that analy analysis? What was your methodology? Um, you know, you actually, you know, um, named names, you know, by putting colleges in the different categories, um, which, you know, may have annoyed some people, but I thought it was great to get that information out there and to kind of, you know, make people aware about how they should think. So I, I think if you could just tell us more about kind of why you decided to do that, kind of the thinking behind the analysis and, and also how people can use that framework, you know, going forward. Yeah, so we created um, four quadrants, uh, two axes, a value to cost ratio, which sought to quantify each school's value relative to its tuition costs. So we looked, and then we looked at a vulnerability, two axes, value and vulnerability, and then created four quadrants. 
Um, and the vulnerability was mostly focused on short-term impact from COVID-19. And we looked at endowment per student. So while Princeton doesn't have, has a huge endowment, but it has the largest endowment per student, they're gonna be fine, they're bulletproof. And then we also incorporated in the vulnerability score uh, the percentage of international students, because when you talk about a shock, we saw a scenario where a dramatic portion of international students didn't show up. I mean, if you think of this as a hotel that costs $58,000 to attend, and the guy who runs the hotel is a, is, a, is a raging bigot, you might decide that you don't want to show up, or you think, oh, the hotel is in infected with this virus, and the people running the hotel don't seem to be that welcoming to me. The 400,000 international students who come to our universities, a lot of them might just might, I mean, put, the, put yourself in their shoes. They might just say, you know, I'm going to take this year off, or I'm going to go to NCIAT. It's uh, so we see that as a point of vulnerability. And then on value, we looked at brand equity. We looked at Google search volume. We looked at ranking. We looked at student life according to niche. We looked at iPads around NPV scores 15 and 30 years out in terms of your uh, earnings. And then we looked at all of this over the tuition. I would have loved to have gotten net tuition scores. We couldn't find that. And then we created basically a, a uh, a value rating. If it's one, it means that relative to everybody else, it is an index. The tuition is exactly in line with its position in the marketplace as it relates to its brand equity, its your earnings potential. And then we created vulnerability and we divided it all into four metrics. And then I started getting cease and desist letters from any from universities in the in the wrong quadrant. Uh oh. <laughs> um, and did you change any of them or you just stopped talking about it? We changed absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> we, we did change the methodology. Um, we put it out as a worksheet and invited everyone to provide input and use it as their own tool. The one thing we did do was the, the quadrant that had high vulnerability and low value, we called Parish, and we renamed that to Struggle because I heard from a lot of chancellors and presidents saying, I mean, the bottom is they just they called and said, Scott, you're not helping. That doesn't help me. And I thought that was a fair criticism and that the word perish uh, created a lot of panic that probably wasn't necessary. So we changed that to struggle. But things like endowment per student, do you include the part-time students as well? Do you, uh, what constitutes NPV? There was just a lot of input, but you know, the way I would describe this study, uh, which got a lot of attention was it's absolutely the worst in the world, except for all the rest. No one has tried to assemble a list. No one has tried to assemble the vulnerability and the actual value of these institutions. They have pieces of it. And so we've made the sheet downloadable and everyone, and I think it's been downloaded over 11,000 times. Wow. So we invite anyone to take our data and do what they want with it. It's meant to be a tool to help you understand how to allocate your finite resources. But I have been saying provocative, things about the largest organizations in the world for a long time. I have never received the kind of blowback as we did when we started categorizing universities. It was shocking to me how, how upset and angry um, university, it was always university leadership, that, uh, how angry they got. But anyways, uh, that's how we went about it. And um, so if I'm like an average parent, like what could I take away from it? You know, you've talked a lot, so a lot about just how colleges brand themselves, right? You know, like there's kind of this um, branding model going on. And so should I really be looking at if, I, if my child gets into a school that maybe doesn't have that brand, but has the same price as a branded school that, you know, should I be thinking twice about spending that type of money? So uh, to be honest, I, we originally did it thinking that it would be a tool for university leadership, not for parents. I mean, if there's, I mean, there's a pretty basic test. If you, if you go into a room and all six people have heard of a school, it's not going out of business anytime soon. I mean, they're, 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 I mean, Jeff's stat was really staggering that I think he said 60 or 80 are, are actual, there's a, there's a demand and everybody else is selling into the market. I thought that was incredible. So, and a decent test is everyone's heard of Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is probably, I, I don't even, I don't even need Susan. I can tell that that <laughs> probably is not, that Vanderbilt's going to be around for at least four years. The, it's, it's the universities where no one's heard of them and they have a niche offering. And the other thing I think you need to be thoughtful around is not only whether or not the university is vulnerable, 
but whether the program that your kid's going to go into is vulnerable. Because I hear some pretty good brand names where their MBA class is 60 kids. And I think two bad years, and they're going to do away with their MBA program. Yep. And you're going to be with a degree from a university that might be a good university, but no longer has an, is offering an MBA. But the, I, I, you know, I think, I think most parents, it, there's some very, you know, there's some basics. If it's a brand name school, you don't need to worry about it going out of business. I don't, I don't think that's right. And then I don't know if uh, Susan's firm publishes uh, almost like a Z score, a debt score, looking at just endowment to debt. Because even though the endowment is designated, Stanford decided to, to close down the volleyball and the tennis team rather than dip into their $35 billion endowment and then said that essentially they weren't going to do that because they had already committed their endowment to capital calls for private equity funds. So Stanford is no longer an educational institution. It's a hedge fund that offers classes to the children of its investors, as far as I can tell. But you're, if they really got desperate, they could borrow against that endowment. Right. They could. I mean, a thirty five billion dollar asset is an asset. So I, I don't think that I, I didn't really build this thing thinking it would be much of a tool for parents. I don't think most 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 parents need to worry in the short term around the financial viability of a school unless it's a school you haven't heard of. That's got a very high kind of over 50 or 60 percent admit rate, because if we see the demand destruction we're thinking about, they could come up 20 percent short in their class. And if they have no endowment highly uh, highly dependent upon international students and a, a small campus and financial scores that, uh, that maybe uh, Susan might have some red flags around, then you're seeing a university. But, and I'd love to know if what Jeff and Susan think, but I've, I've seen numbers that 1,000 to 1,500 universities could go out of business in the next 10 years, which yeah. is like one in three could go out of business. So it has become... It has become a viable danger. But I'd say the, just the initial litmus test is you walk into a room, how many people have heard the school? Brand equity is a tremendous forward-looking indicator, I think, of their survivability. Mm -hmm. And so, Scott, just to, to respond to that, um, you know, what we do at Moody's is, is we do take a very long-term view. We're, we're trying to assess whether a college or university is able to repay its debt over a 30-year to 50 year time frame, that's typically the tenor of debt. So what we're trying to assess is what's the likelihood that they're going to default on their own right. debt. And, and really the fundamental analysis is driven by a market analysis. Is this college or university offering a product that someone wants to support? And that someone is either students willing to pay tuition because they think that they're getting a value from that education. It could be alumni who have just an intrinsic feeling that the mission of the school is one that they want to continue yeah, to support. Goodwill. It could be the federal or state government saying yeah. that there's a real social role for this college or university for a particular purpose. And they might step up, which I think yeah. ultimately gets to your question of, can you predict which colleges or universities are going to close? It's hard because there's so many constituents with so many vested interests um, that, that I think that's a hard decision. But I think it is also fair to say, you know, we've got a higher education system that has kind of evolved and been built up over a couple of hundreds of years, right? So if you were to kind of rationally design a higher education system today, it would not look anything like what we have today. And like any other industry, yeah. we call it a period of transformation. Higher education is in a period of transformation. And some schools are going to close. You've got your, your quadrants, some are going to close, some are going to be doing just fine and some will indeed be thriving. Um, I would say the ones we think are most vulnerable are the, the smaller colleges because scale matters and scale is going to increasingly matter. Um, so small colleges are, are going to really be challenged. And I, I saw a question come in, how about all of these colleges where you see that they're, they're cutting their budgets now that could actually be a good thing because I think what colleges are realizing is they can't be all things to all people. And all of these programs that they've built up over time may or may not have demand in the marketplace. And they, they in order to survive, they're going to have to rationalize those. So I, I think it is a, an inflection point for the sector. I think the current crisis accelerates that. I think there's going to be more cuts coming but that could ultimately mean that we end up with a, a healthier higher ed sector than what, what we have today. Agreed. Debbie, I just want to make one quick point because I thought Scott had a really good point about programs, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's all these universities out there to, 
you know, the, uh, the sellers in my analysis, right? Those ones with great brand names, to be honest with you, no matter what you major in, it doesn't really matter. In some cases, it's that piece of paper, you're really buying that network, you're buying that brand. At most other places though, they may not go out of business, but they're going to shrink most likely in, in the coming years. Uh, you know, I know this from talking to presidents who are already planning to shrink programs and things like that, which of course they're not telling anybody out there. So my concern, if you're on the other side right now, and you're not going to go to one of those top ranked sellers that I was talking about earlier, but you're going to go to one of those other things, one of those other places is really around programs. And you really have to think about, is this a program my college might be in business, but my program might be out of business. And if you're not going to that buyer college that has top ranked programs and what you're going into, then that is a concern because those are probably the programs that are going to close first, right? If the college you're going to is known for music and you're majoring in music or you're majoring in communications and it's known for communications. But if it's like Scott said, right, everybody's offering MBA, you know, business, undergraduate business is a dime a dozen in higher ed. Uh, you know, most humanities programs, unfortunately, because I'm a fan of the humanities, dime a dozen at most places, right? So if you're just going to kind of a run of the mill program at kind of a run of the mill college, those are the ones I'd be worried about. Those are the programs I'd be worried about. And I would look more closely at the program because again, if you go to the college, the college might not go into business, but they're going to have to teach out your program. There's going to be all these issues you're going to run into by program, not necessarily by college. And Jeff, any advice? Like, again, how would a parent kind of, and students look at like which of those programs might be? I mean, do you just look at which of the, the percentage of it, students that are, that are kind of like in most- Exactly. It, to be honest with you, if the school's not known for that program, that should be a red flag. Uh, that's where you should start to really investigate that a little bit more. Or look at, you know, start asking questions about enrollment. What's the enrollment been in your, uh, you know, your history department or your- you know, business, whatever it might be, look at those enrollment trends, because if the enrollment's been going like this in those programs, those are going to be the ones most likely on the cutting block. So again, the college might survive, but your program might not. So um, there's a question here that says, uh, many parents have begun to parrot Scott's term of the administrative bloat, and they've actually asked how to access, access that data. I know, Scott, if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your opinion about administrative bloat, and then if Susan or Jeff has, has any thoughts about um, whether that's something that people should be concerned about, should they look into it? Is that going to make a difference in their decision? So, look, I, I've gotten a decent amount of pushback um, on this, from mostly from administrators. I think that, first off, let me say, I've been, I've been in academia for 20 years. I think I work with some of the finest people um, in academia and, and a lot of good people. Um, but in general, I find almost every decision that's been made by university administrators over the last two decades is with one end goal, and that's to reduce their accountability and increase their compensation. And we have this notion that for some reason, people in academia, that we're not capitalists, that we don't want to work less hard and make more money. And what's been set up is the ultimate cartel that the Wall Street Journal and US News and Report help support, where as long as we maintain very, very low admittance rates, we can continue to charge these irrational margins and come up with new departments and new vice chancellors that make $400,000 a year, plus benefits, plus a team of four people. Uh, it's just the administrative bloat is, is um, I think it's, it, I don't want to use the word criminal. I think it's irresponsible. And the result is there's been a one and a half trillion dollar transfer of wealth from middle and upper middle in income households to universities in the form of debt over the last 30 years. So I would just look at it as, look, uh, you know, 97 of the 100 highest paid public servants in the state of Massachusetts work for one employer, the University of Massachusetts. They, and they're not increasing their class size. The NPV of the earnings of their students or their rankings hasn't increased. The only thing that's increased has been tuition and salary of administrators. Uh, so, and, and it's not, you know, I just see it at, I see it at every university I'm involved with, new worthwhile departments. And once they're up, they don't go away. Mm -hmm. And they're expensive. And we enter into this consensual hallucination that they're adding value that we have a new department on sustainability and we can't even define what sustainability is. 
and we have a few classes and it makes for a great press release and it's thoughtful, nice people running the department and it's another two or $3 million a year that gets passed on to the students in the form of debt. So yeah, I think the administrative bloat is, is absolutely stifling, but so is the Rolexification of these universities. When I went to UCLA in the eighties, it was a shitty building. It, my, my business school Barrows at Haas, it was a fire hazard. <laughs> And we've turned these places into the Ritz Carlton Brentwood. And, and I, you know, the buildings aren't there for the students. They're there for the alumni and donors. Right. And these things have become so extraordinarily expensive to maintain. Tenure, uh, in my opinion, is just essentially a, is nothing but debt on young people. I think it makes sense in the humanities. I understand it's a worthwhile protection. But at the business school, we haven't said anything that controversial in 50 years. So we end up with... 60% of our faculty just become overpaid. So yeah, I, the, my fear around this crisis is, in, is it isn't deep enough to inspire the type of change and the type of discipline and the type of cost cutting that every household and business in America has to go through on a regular basis and that we won't lower our costs and pass on those cost savings to middle-class families that we ended up with this cartel and this luxury brand mentality where we see ourselves as luxury brands, not public servants and keep passing on uh, higher costs and more debt to middle-class families. So my attitude is we've stuck our chin out and bring it on. There's, there's a reckoning coming and, and we deserve it. Well, that's what I'm kind of wondering. You know, there's definitely a reckoning coming, but is it, are they really gonna, you know, look at these expenses and start cutting them? Um, or like, are they, you know, I see uh, faculty being furloughed, you know, so are they cutting in the right places? So, uh, and, and I know, I'm sorry, you, I'm, I'm hogging the air. Susan, are you going to say something? Go, go ahead, Scott, and then I'll make a point afterwards. I think you're going to see several universities. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, and occasionally you hear about a startup that has a burn rate of $2 million a month when it goes out of business because they enter into hallucination that they'll figure it out. They're in denial. I think you're going to see some universities literally crashing a wall. When you have the president of Chapman University put out a press release that they're making brutal cost cuts, including delaying the construction of the new gym, and he's taking a 15% cut to his $700,000 salary. And the notion that he feels those are brutal cost cuts right, right. gives you a sense of the gestalt of universities. I think university administrators are physically incapable almost of cutting costs because they've been able to raise them for 40 years. So when a species or an organism never has to adapt to a certain skill set, it gets starched out of the species. So I think we're gonna probably have to figure out a way to increase capacity and lower costs per student. But between tenure and extraordinarily beautiful buildings, a lot of these costs are fixed, which is an amazing business model on the way up because you have gross mark. Tomorrow, to, wait, tomorrow, Tuesday night, I kick off brand strategy, 280 students at NYU, all Zoom, $7,000, 280 kids, $1.96 million. I'm good at what I do. Some nights I'm even great. Am I worth $135,000 a night? So it, it, this is just, this is just <laughs> unsustainable. I don't think cost cutting, I don't think it's in their DNA. Um, so I think we're going to have to move to big to technology and try, try and decrease the cost per student by, by increasing enrollments at the best universities. I think that's the most viable solution, but I'd be curious what the panelists think. Yeah, and, and I'll just chime in and then maybe Jeff, but I, I did just see a, a question come across the screen about what do we see as the role of community colleges in all of this? And that was really the point that I was going to make is if, if you think about where students are enrolled today, 40% of students are enrolled in community colleges, another 40% are in public universities. So when we talk about this very high cost model, we're talking about a very high cost model that serves a small proportion of the student population. And, and Scott, I'm, I won't at all dispute your um, part of your assessment. Um, I do think we're asking, we as a society have asked a lot of, college, of colleges and universities and part of what you're describing is really what consumers are demanding of them because if they don't have that nicest building, the yeah. parents on this call are going to, to look for the school yeah. that does have the nicest building. So it's a it's this real competitive cycle of this question of what is it that we're valuing in education yeah. and how is it being developed, delivered? And I think that's where this shakeout is going to go come from. And it goes to what Jeff was saying, which is where is the return on education? 
But uh, again, it goes to the vibrancy of the sector. You do have low cost alternatives that don't have those fancy buildings. Yeah. And it's a question of are, are parents going to shift their preferences to that? Or are they going to say, we're willing to pay for this because we do want that nice dorm. We do want the tenured professor. We do want the class of 10 students. And that's really a consumer driven choice. And I think that's a good point. I, I am not defending colleges and universities here at all, but I think that there's not a lot of constituencies at certain places for lower costs because parents go on these tours and they say, wait a second, I was just down the street at X college and they had a brand new dorm and they had a brand new business school and they had sushi in the dining hall and they had a climbing wall and whatever, right? And so college administrators hear that and they say, well, to compete with that other university, we also need that, right? There's just this arms race that has really gotten out of control, um, that has been subsidized, unfortunately, by governments and increasingly by families and by students going into debt. And until somebody says stop, and maybe this is it, maybe this is going to be finally it, um, until somebody says stop, then, um, then it just keeps going. And I think one of the things I keep seeing in the comments, and I know Scott has thoughts on this, is that Colleges and universities are seen as the gatekeeper to the rest of life. And, and, and they know that, right? So they know they have this control on, on the credential that is the signal to the job market. And so they know they can charge as much as they want because everybody has to go through that narrow pathway to get to the other side. Um, and until that's broken or changed, that's the other thing I think really against kind of the changes that I think we need in, in higher ed. Yeah, to just to expand on that, if you really look at the disease, we're talking about the symptoms, the disease you're going to have to fix here before any of this stuff, we, we can talk a big game about, you know, parents have to stop all crowding into the same school and wanting to go to the Ivy League. You know, we can all we can all talk about that. But until corporations until mm -hmm. the most prestigious organizations in the world, until, until Google, the World Bank, Comcast, and, and Carnival Cruises says, we're going to actively try and recruit people from non-brand name universities, or maybe even figure out on-ramping for kids for the two thirds of young adults that don't graduate from college, we're never gonna break the wheel. Because the best, you know, the best, the, the, the greatest wealth creating entities in the history of mankind, U.S. corporations, are absolutely drunk on the exclusive brand names as the merit badge to get an interview at their organization. I worked at Morgan Stanley. We recruited at seven schools. I was the first one they ever hired from UCLA. And I used, they thought of me as, you know, total, you know, the poor kid, because I w just went to UCLA with it, you know, and, and until universities, until until organizations, I'm sorry, until companies say, all right, what's so exciting about the Google certificate is they're saying with the six month certificate, we'll count it as if it's a it's a an undergraduate equivalent degree. But if you really wanted to participate, if you really wanted to make higher ed, if you wanted to break the caste system and the Rolexification and the luxury branding that is higher ed, you would, as an employer, if you're hiring people, really give a hard look at people that maybe didn't just go to great colleges. Uh, because I can, prove to, I can prove to you that 99% of our kids are not in the top 1%. And we're creating with the education system just this incredible, incredible trajectory for the 1%. But the rest end up in mediocre universities and kind of sets a mediocre trajectory for their professional life until companies start thinking of thinking of qualifications differently. Debbie, I want to throw in, um, uh, add to something Susan said earlier about community colleges, because she's right, right? 40 plus percent, I think it's like 48% now of American college students go to community colleges, right? They, they start there. And what's unfortunate is many students start there. They don't necessarily finish, or if they finish, they don't necessarily transfer. Transfer is a huge problem right now. But I would actually encourage parents, because I see this often where students are thinking so much about college and we have this image in our mind, it has to be a four-year residential college. And I meet so many first-year students at colleges and universities. This goes back to the administrative bloat where they've added all of these uh, advisors and other things to kind of keep these students in school because they're not quite sure why they're there or what they're doing there. They're kind of aimless. 
and a community college actually would have been a great start for them to kind of get a, get a sense of what's out there, take a few classes, earn some credits at a very low price in many cases, and then transfer. Now I'm, I'm saying this is a little bit easier than sometimes it really is, especially selective colleges do not like community college transfers, but, but many public colleges, there's, there's a lot of pathways in many states from your local, you know, Florida's great at this, Arizona's great at this, California's getting better at this, where you could start at your community college and have a direct yeah. pathway right into the four-year college. And I will tell you the, the most, some of those recent data I was looking, more than a quarter of students at community colleges come from families making six figures, right? Over a hundred thousand dollars a year. So increasingly parents who we used to think would send their kids to four-year colleges are increasingly starting at two-year colleges. And I would encourage people to think about that, especially if you don't quite know why you're going to this four-year college and why you're paying the amount of money you're paying. Um, yeah, you guys are all bringing up important points and it's really about kind of breaking the cycle, you know, at all levels. It's parents, you know, breaking their, their thinking of, um, of what, you know, a school, what the type of school is that their student has to go to or start in. It's the corp breaking the corporation's idea of, you know, where they need to recruit. Um, we hope maybe, maybe not, you know, we, we are breaking the, the thinking of colleges and what they need to have to attract students. Um, all I can I hope that something like, you know, COVID and the pandemic and um, can really shake this up because um, a lot of the comments people are saying they, it just it's a broken system and it needs to be, you know, shaken up and fixed um, and quickly. Um, and then there's so many indicators um, that we don't want to look at anymore, particularly, you know, student debt, which, you know, um, has just increased wildly over the past few years. Um, so, but related to this whole discussion, and there's a question here and um, about credentialing and, and what do you think about, besides just kids maybe starting at um, community college or there's this Google uh, certificate program, but what about this idea of giving over credentialing to third parties? You know, um, are there any ones that you know of that are emerging and, and how do you think that will play into the marketplace? Will, will, is that part of breaking the corporation's thinking of what's you know, good or what's not good in terms of recruiting? Will they value as much um, a student coming from uh, someplace that, that they didn't go to a traditional four-year college? It was more of this you know, type of credentialing program. Anybody have any thoughts? I'll, I'll have a quick thought. I know Scott's been talking about a lot. He talked, mentioned the Google certificate earlier. What I hope to see, there's this great program at uh, Make School out in uh, San Francisco, which is kind of a coding boot camp that really sends students on to Google and Facebook and others. And they partnered with Dominican University, which is a local liberal arts college, to kind of come up with a combined four-year degree, right, where the college is providing kind of the liberal arts platform background, uh, the, uh, and then the make school is doing kind of the technical work on top of that. I mean, that to me is a big part of the future where there's, there's nothing special about a four-year degree. Uh, and I, my hope is that we can start to have more micro degrees, smaller, shorter ways of, of getting education, because we're going to have to get education for the rest of our life anyway. Um, we're going to constantly need to reskill and upskill. And so why not have these shorter degrees that, uh, that kind of put you right into the, into the job market? And, and to me, that's how some of these small colleges survive, is to really kind of just bust apart the four-year degree as it exists now, partner with these other entities such as make school or partner with companies if you can in kind of your signature programs get rid of everything else that is not really good anyway um, and then focus on what is really your strength no good point scott any thoughts about that i know you've talked about you know something along those lines there's there's so many interesting hacks uh and uh, jeff and susan talked about i'm working with the regents of the university of california but you go for two years at 8,000 a year, then transfer to a name brand that's 48 and you bring down the cost of your degree 40%, right? Yep. And quite frankly, some kids just aren't ready for the competitiveness of a name brand university. We have, I would argue the 18 year old today is not as well prepared emotionally and mentally uh, for a variety of reasons as they were 20 or 30 years ago. And we see kind of this, I don't know, we're seeing, um, one of my colleagues at NYU, Jonathan Haidt, talks a lot about this emerging mental health crisis. And a lot of university administrators have unwittingly become mental health counselors for freshmen. Uh, so I think junior college and community college is fantastic. And Susan had a great point. 
I think the entire Ivy League enrollment is 65,000 students. FSU has 75,000. I mean, they command a lot of oxygen in the media. Exactly. But, but in terms of America, they're almost, I don't want to say they're meaningless, but they're, they're, you know, there's two cohorts that go to the Ivy League, children of rich kids and what I'll call freakishly remarkable 15 to 17 year olds who find a way to patent something at the age of 16. But America goes to public school. Amer and where you're gonna, where you need to see real change if you're gonna ch move the needle in America is Cal State, a half a million kids. University of Texas system, 200,000 kids. Florida, uh, University of California, 250,000 kids. Michigan, I mean, these schools, this is where America gets educated. And I believe that we're going to, what we need to do is embrace a lot of different norms, embrace what, you know, what I, my advice to these universities is if you take half your classes online, which faculty, of course, is resisting, you effectively double the supply. Yep. And we need to move back to an environment, you know, it, it, universities have become this caste system where uh, uh, faculty, including my own, see our job is to take the top 1% and to turn them into billionaires or presidents or prime ministers. And I don't think that's the role higher ed plays in our society. The, the role of higher ed is to take good kids and give them remarkable opportunities. And the University of California, when I applied to UCLA, had a 60% admit rate. Now it's 12. So the son of a single immigrant mother who didn't have great grades but didn't test well either couldn't have gotten into UCLA now. And so we need to fall back in love as corporations, as societies, as taxpayers. We need to fall back in love with the unremarkables. And say, so how do we get out of, how do we break this, this intoxication with exclusivity that we as alumni, we as admissions directors, we as faculty have? At NYU, we brag that 88% of applicants didn't get in. We say that as if it's a good thing. That's like the head of a housing shelter brag that night. We turned away 90% of the people who showed up last night because we have such an awesome uh, uh, homeless shelter. I mean, it's just we've totally lost the script, totally lost the script. So I think we just absolutely I think the public university is a great goal for us would be to say, how do we double the enrollment at our amazing public universities that are really the I think the crown jewel of America, uh, because the Ivy League, that gets a lot of attention. They can have their rankings. They can educate rich kids. They can find, you know, the the. the the sultans and the prime ministers will send their kids there, fine. Where America moves the needle in higher ed, as at the University of Wisconsin, University of Virginia schools, the public schools, the Cal State schools, that's where we're going to change America. And we need to go back to loving the unremarkables with much lower costs and much higher admit rates. Debbie, I think Scott brings up a great point about scarcity. It drives me insane. There's a, a stat I have in the book, because we think in, in America that scarcity is good. And that that equals elite and that equals quality. Um, and, and I'll tell you what drove it. So this is the 1989 rankings of U.S. News and World Report, the first annual rankings they put out. If you look at the top 25, there were a lot of publics in the top 25 back in 1989. And today there are very few of them because all of the metrics that U.S. News uh, ranks are all based on spending more money. Yeah. Yeah. It's all based on smaller class sizes, paying your faculty more, all those things. And so we tend to think, well, quality must mean small. In Canada- And quality means you have to be on the rankings. And you have to be on the rankings, right? Mm -hmm. I point this out in the book. In Canada, the top three most exclusive universities or the, the ones the highest ranked, the University of Toronto and McGill and University of British Columbia, they enroll something like 140,000 undergraduates. If you go down the top 25 in the U.S. news rankings, you would have to go down to number 19 to get 140,000 undergraduates or something like that, right? So we need 18 schools to equal what Canada does in three schools. And, and so I think that that's the only way we do break this is that the, I think the public's lead, I, I'm a special advisor out at Arizona State and, and Michael Crow, the president out there, talks about this all the time, right? We should be judged by who we include, not who we exclude. Um, and I think that has to be true for more, especially the publics. Um, I think we should stop talking about the Ivies and, and those elite schools. I get it. That's where a lot of people want to go because they think that's the access into the elite jobs. But there's a lot more jobs out there than the elite jobs out there anyway. And so 
this is this is the argument that I think we should be having. So, Susan, I'm wondering what you can add, you know, um, just from a financial standpoint, this is all, you know, great, but we also know that, um, you know, the public public universities are a lot supported by, you know, state funding and they're going to be in trouble because of, you know, everything that's happening. Yeah, well, I, I think it is going to be a, a there, there's been a disinvent, disinvestment by states over time um, in public higher education. They have, states have multiple competing priorities as well. Um, and as the population ages, more money is going to go into types of programs that support an aging population. So I, I think that higher education is going to be challenged at the state level for state support. Um, the federal government in some ways ha has stepped in. So if you kind of look at statistics of state versus federal support for higher education, um, the proportionate change shifted a while ago. Um, so, so yes, absolutely, there are going to be some challenging times. Again, public universities have more scale. So I just do want to circle back to kind of what Jeff and Scott were saying and kind of where I started from, which is there's a role for the Ivy League in the US and this goes to the diversity of the product, right? Um, there's a role for the large universities like Arizona State and Cal State and it's finding the right fit for the right student and having your student be successful at the school. That's where the return on investment comes from. But the other thing that we have to remember is that the population that's going to school today versus 25 years ago or 50 years ago is so much more socioeconomically diverse than it ever has been before, right? The participation rates have kind of leveled off, but if you go back, it's a very, very different student population that colleges and universities are already serving. And that in part is what drives the cost. I think, I can't remember if it was Scott or Jeff who alluded to kind of the mental health issues, right? We're expecting more of our colleges and universities than a desk and a chalkboard and that comes with a cost and the real question facing America and the real question facing the financial health of colleges and universities is who is going to bear that cost. Are, are students willing to do it? Is the government going to do it? Are there going to be other alternative sources of revenue or does it come back to how do we reframe our budget models and our business models to a very different reality? And I think that's those are the questions that colleges and universities and mass and individually are going to be confronting over the next couple of years. Um, this is a great discussion. I can't believe actually we're already um, over an hour. So um, I am gonna wrap it up. I wanna really thank all of you, the three of you. I don't know if there's, I'll give you each maybe like if there's one last thing you wanna give um, advice. And again, kind of think that there are parents out here. That's really you know, what this webinar was for. If you have one you know, last piece of advice, if you wanna share um, with parents as they're kind of you know, thinking about either spending the money to go to a school or kind of you know, trying to break this cycle of what's happening um, in higher education, you know, uh, what, what would you what would you say to a parent who has a, a high school senior right now? Any uh, last thoughts? Two quick, two quick things. One is um, make sure you think about financial fit in addition to academic and social fit. Um, and all this talk about the prestige and the rankings and things like that, I, I do urge you to check out the book because I have this great story about how some colleges really um, manipulate, you know, have worked over the years to rise in the rankings. And so some of this is a big mirage by, uh, by some colleges. And so don't get caught up in, you know, does your college that you're thinking about rank 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, because in many cases, it doesn't matter. Susan, any of I bet Susan, you'll say you'll go back to fit. Right. <laughs> I kind of feel like I just gave my summarizing remarks, but Jeff, I, I do have your book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Thanks, Susan. And Scott, any last last comments? I mean, you know, you're, you teach at NYU, and you know, um, you know, I don't know, you know, if you tell those kids to still come or you know start looking elsewhere, or you know, what you would you know say to your own you know child if they, they were starting this admissions process. Yeah, I think that a lot of candid conversations um, with your kid early around, all right, this is really competitive. We're going to don't fall in love with any one school because that almost guarantees you're going to get your heart broken. And 
uh, you know, we've all got to have honest, open conversations around the financial, the, the financials. And, you know, I, the, the message I would have to parents as citizens and as alumni of universities is I, I feel collectively like, you know, spring used to be this j nervous but joyous time. You were nervous about getting into your school, but you knew you were getting into a good school and you knew you were going to be able to afford it. I, I, my mother lived and died a secretary, and I knew that getting I was going to get into a decent school and we were going to be able to figure it out. And now I think that spring has become really a, a season of despair and disappointment for mm -hmm. a lot of American households. And I feel like millions of households are literally crying out to some of the people on this phone, on this panel, and to citizens and voters that we have to dramatically expand the enrollments of public at universities such that good kids have remarkable opportunities instead of just remarkable kids being shot into outer space. We need to move back. We need to fall back in love with the remarkables and hire kids from non-brand name schools. Make sure that uh, your university is doing everything it can to expand enrollments and hasn't become drunk on exclusivity and vote for um, public officials who are going to fund state schools. All great advice. I really appreciate it. Somebody mentioned, um, you know, that this was a great webinar. We need more of these. So let me just tell you, we actually are going to have something similar in a few weeks um, on us, you know, related but slightly different topic. So watch um, for that announcement. It'll be middle of October. And um, Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Susan. This was great. Um, great to have all the different vantage points. And I really think that we opened up the eyes of parents and um, they have much more to think about, um, which is the purpose of tonight. So good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Scott.